Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Jonathan, can you go to the next slide, please? Before we get started, I just wanted to provide some information on how we can get the most from this uh, session today. Please use the chat box to write in questions or comments. The questions will be asked of the speakers once they are finished presenting. Um, make sure to give additional feedback at the end by filling out the evaluation. And this presentation will be recorded and will be available to watch online. Um, also, I just wanted to, I, I failed to mention on behalf of the National Hemophilia Foundation, welcome to aging. Uh, my name is Michelle Rice, and um, I am going to turn this over to Marcy uh, at the moment. Jonathan, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we have just a few more minutes. Um, oh, one slide too far. <laughs> Thank you. We have just a few more minutes until we officially get started. Um, so we will move forward in just a moment. Again, if you're just joining us, welcome to the public health session on aging and we will be getting started in just a moment. All right, my name is Dr. Marcy Hardy and I am the manager of medical education grants here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. And I will be your moderator today for our session on public health and aging. Jonathan, if you could put the slide back up, please, sorry. <laughs> um, I would like to just welcome you all to this session and I'd like to thank Takeda for their generous sponsorship of this presentation. Oh, one slide forward, please. This um, presentation today, the public health session, is put together by the different organizations who have been funded through the Blood Disorders Division with the Centers for Disease Control. And so Cure Hereditary Hemorrhagic Telegentia, Cooley's Anemia Foundation, Hemophilia Federation of America, and the National Hemophilia Foundation have worked together to bring this information on different blood disorders to the bleeding disordered community to let everyone be aware of the different projects and things that they are working on. Again, the session focuses on aging. We each of the presenters are going to be sharing their information with you and then immediately following each presenter, we'll be asking them questions. So if you could please let me know in the chat if you have any questions for each of the presenters, we'll be asking them when they're done. And with that, I would like to pass this on to Dr. Raj Kasturi. He is the professor of medicine in the division of hematology and the blood research center at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's also the director of UNC HHT Center of Excellence and the associate director for clinical research at the UNC blood research center, as well as a member of CURE HHT scientific and medical advisory committee. Today, Dr. Kasturi will present be presenting on the impact of comorbidities and aging on disease manifestations and treatment in HHT. Dr. Kasturi. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank the National Hemophilia Foundation and the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be part of this session today. I'll be presenting on aging and HHT. 
I don't have any disclosures that are relevant to today's talk. Over the next 20, 25 minutes, what I'd like to cover is give you all a very brief overview of HHT. I won't go into too much detail in the interest of time, but I'd refer you to the session we did yesterday on, on health equities, where I did cover a little more in, by way of background for HHT. Uh, I'll talk about the impact of aging on various disease-related manifestations as it pertains to HHT, what we know about mortality in HHT, and some of the challenges that we face with managing comorbidities that are age-related uh, in a person with HHT. So what is HHT? It's an autosomal dominant multi-system blood vessel disorder that causes recurrent spontaneous bleeding. It occurs because of defects in angiogenesis that cause the development of telangiectasias, which are tiny blood vessels uh, over mucocutaneous surfaces or arteriovenous malformations in internal organs in the body. There is a wide range of clinical manifestations and presentations in people affected with HHT. Interestingly, even within the family where multiple family members have the same underlying genetic mutation that causes HHT, the phenotype or their clinical manifestations can vary tremendously. How common is HHT? It occurs in one in 5,000 people, which would mean there are about 70,000 affected people with HHT in the United States. There is a slight female preponderance, about 60% of all uh, affected individuals seem to be women. It affects all races equally, as best we know. And it is considered a bleeding disorder and classified as a rare bleeding disorder by the CDC. It is, a, it is being one in 5,000, the second most common rare bleeding disorder, inherited bleeding disorder. Um, although the underlying cause of, of the or tendency for bleeding is not because of a deficiency of any clotting factor, but because of loss of integrity in the vessel wall. Uh, nonetheless, the end point or end result is bleeding. How do these patients present? Uh, they develop telangiectasias over the skin, the lining of the, the mouth, the lips, the buccomucosa, tongue, fingers, so mucocutaneous surfaces. 90 to 95% of people will have these telangiectasias by the age of 40 to 45. And the result of these telangiectasias can be bleeding, nosebleeds, epistaxis, spots in the tongue and the oral cavity can also bleed, spots on the gum can bleed. Um, epistaxis will develop in over 95% of people with HHT. Gastrointestinal bleeding, for, again, from telangiectasias that develop over the lining of the intestine can also occur, tends to happen with age. Um, so less common in people younger than 40, more common in people older than 50. And overall, will develop in up to 30% of all individuals with HHT. The consequence of all of this bleeding is development of iron deficiency and anemia. Abnormal uh, blood vessels, so arteriovenous malformations, can develop in visceral organs. Uh, they happen in the lung in 30 to 50% of affected patients. And this can lead to decreased oxygen levels or hypoxia, can result in paradoxical embolism because of the abnormal communication that bypasses the capillary filter in the lungs. So this can be thromboembolism, DVTs crossing over, uh, DVTs, PEs crossing over and causing stroke. It can be bacteria crossing over uh, and causing systemic abscesses, brain abscess, osteomyelitis because of bone infection, uh, et cetera. Um, bad um, or large uh, lung AVMs can also rupture and cause hemorrhage. Thankfully, that's a rare outcome. And an association with migraine has also been reported in people who have lung AVMs. Brain AVMs can occur in 5 to 15% of affected individuals and can, if that hemorrhages, can cause a stroke. Um, headaches and seizures are also reported as a result of brain AVMs. Liver AVMs tend to develop, or common, tend to develop with age, and in older individuals, up to 75% of people with HHT have liver AVMs. Not all of them are symptomatic, only a minority are. But if they develop symptoms, liver AVMs can result in a high output heart failure, 
biliary necrosis and encephalopathy. How do we diagnose HHD? HHD is an underdiagnosed disorder and only one out of 10 affected individuals carry a diagnosis of HHD. Uh, and there are a number of reasons why this could be and the consequences of this, this delayed diagnosis or underdiagnosis was discussed extensively in, in yesterday's health equity session. I refer you to that. In terms of management of HHT, what are the various components of taking care of a person with HHT? Um, genetic counseling, because it's an autosomal dominant disorder, if a person has it, then 50% of all of their first degree relatives are also at risk for having it. And, and therefore they need to be counseled appropriately tested. All patients with HHT need to undergo screening for AVMs and internal organs, um, brain screening of the brain with an MRI, screening for lung AVMs with either a bubble echocardiogram, that's a delayed bubble echo or a CT scan, uh, when appropriate and in the appropriate patient um, screening for liver AVMs as well, uh, and in the appropriate patient looking for intestinal telangiectasias too. So screening is a big part of this and, and there are guidelines on when and how to screen people with HHT. And, and those were revised, the revised guidelines for treatment of HHT were recently published September of last year. Uh, and those are available on the um, Cure HHT website for, for everybody, it's curehht.org. I unfortunately won't go into the guidelines um, today in the interest of time. Antibiotic prophylaxis, uh, following or, or prior to, sorry, dental procedures is an important component as well in patients who have not undergone screening for lung AVMs or are known to have lung AVMs uh, because it is quite common for bacteria to get into the circulation following dental procedures and in the susceptible individual, this can cause systemic infections. In terms of treatment, appropriate treatment of epistaxis and nosebleeds, GI bleeding, as well as anemia and iron deficiency are important components of treatment in addition to managing these AVMs, uh, either embolizing them to close them or managing them symptomatically as with liver AVMs is critical. Okay, so that's a background on HHT. Now let's talk about aging a little bit. What is the impact of age on management of HHT? What we know is that with increasing age, there is, so increasing age has an impact on bleeding and anemia in, in HHT patients. Bleeding in general tends to get worse as people get older, both nosebleeds as well as GI bleeding, and therefore anemia tends to become a problem in the aging HHT patient. Um, AVMs can become an issue, particularly liver AVMs, which we know tend to develop with increasing age and can be quite difficult to manage. Cardiovascular complications, either because of liver AVMs causing high output heart failure, severe anemia causing a high output state, or non-HHT age-related comorbidities like heart disease, um, atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, et cetera, can also be quite difficult to manage in a patient with a bleeding disorder, as you all know. HHT also impacts a person's quality of life. And as the symptoms become more severe with increasing age, it, it, become, it has a significant impact on quality of life as well. Uh, the mental health of a patient, not just their quality of life, but also their mental health um, is affected by this disease. And I'll present some data on that today. And finally, uh, it, all of this together cumulatively affects survival. And we have some data that ha just having a diagnosis of HHT uh, impacts mortality too. So a little bit on each of these. Um, in terms of impact of age and outcomes in hospitalized patients with HHT, so this was a recent study that, that was quite interesting in terms of findings. This was a study using the na nationwide inpatient sample database. They looked between 2000 and 2012 uh, at 10,293 hospitalizations for HHT. All of these patients had either a primary or a secondary diagnosis of HHT at discharge. And they categorized these patients into four groups based on age, less than 18, 18 to 50, 51 to 65, and those age greater than 65. And in terms of complications, they grouped them into four groups 
hemorrhagic complications, cardiopulmonary complications, neurological complications, and hepatobiliary. They also looked at procedure utilization in these, during these hospitalizations. And their outcomes of interest were in-hospital mortality, discharge location, so were the, were the patients discharged home? Did they go to a long-term care facility? And length of hospital stay, as well as late rates of iatrogenic complications. This is just a list, I won't go into it in too much detail, but a list of all of these four, all of the diagnoses under each of these four groups. Hemorrhagic complications included anemia, epistaxis, GI bleeding, hematemesis, hemoptysis. A cardiovascular, all of the, the cardiac issues, vascular issues, DVT, PE, stroke. Sorry, stroke is under neurological, uh, seizures, headaches, stroke, um, TIAs, brain, ABMs, abscesses were all under neurological complications, and hepatobiliary, liver related issues. In terms of procedures that they looked at, transfusions, upper endoscopy, lower endoscopy, specific procedures for treatment of nosebleeds, as well as uh, IBC filter placement and CPR. So these were complications that they looked at. Now, here's the demographic data. And here is, if you can look at the age, the majority of patients here, as you would expect, are greater than the age of 50. So the bulk of the patients, over 8,000 of the 10,000 were here. In the 51 to 65 were age greater than 65 group. Um, and like has been reported in multiple other studies, slight female preponderance, 55 to 65% of all participants were female. If you look at the age and frequency of specific complications, now these different, this is a bit of a, a dizzying graph, but here, here in the bottom are the different colors and what age they code for. And anemia, which is the most common uh, specific complication, predominantly occurred in people over the age of 40. So it's the blue and, and this pinkish color here that, con that constitute most of the anemia patients Likewise, GI bleeding and epistaxis, because those together would be the primary cause of anemia in these patients. Likewise, CHF tended to happen in older patients. Um, and, and the take home here is 77% of all hospitalizations occurred in people over the age of 50. The majority of them were not elective hospitalizations. And hemorrhagic complications occurred in 62.5% of the patients with anemia being the most common. Cardiopulmonary complications happened in 40% of patients with CHF being the most common. And patients greater than 50 also accounted for a total of 82%, so 83% of all bleeding-related bleeding hospitalizations, 90% of cardiopulmonary issues, and 82% of hepatic complications. Looking at procedures, about half of the patients underwent procedures, the most common being blood transfusions, uh, followed by upper and lower endoscopy, followed then by treatment of nosebleeds. Age was associated with a significant increase in procedure volume. So the older the patient, the more um, likely they were to get a procedure. And here's a split of specific complications by age group. And again, you can see the blue and the green lines here, which are the older population, older two populations, age populations, or had the more complications, except in the neuro neurology group where it was more in the younger population. And that actually, the fact that it's the red bar, the 18 to 50 that had the most neurological complication is interesting in and of itself because the teaching in the HHT world or the belief in the HHT world is intracranial uh, complications that are HHT related tend to happen in the pediatric side. So patients are either born with brain vascular malformations or they develop within the, for in childhood. They don't tend to develop in adulthood uh, although here you can see that the majority of hospitalizations for brain reasons are more in the, in the 18 to 50 age group. So that might maybe reflect um, that we're not screening as aggressively as we should be. Um, and, and so there is, that needs to be looked at in, in more detail. I think it's an interesting finding. In terms of hospital outcomes, um, if you look at where the patients was dis were discharged to, most of the younger patients went home, as you would expect, 90%, 85% in, in those less than 50. Uh, but a good percentage of people um, in the older age groups did not go home and ended up in a long-term care facility. 19.2% uh, uh, went to long-term care in the age greater than 65 group. 
If you look at mortality, uh, the mortality rate was higher in the older population um, as well. No difference in iatrogenic complications. So that, that tells us then as HHT, in the aging patient, HHT related manifestations uh, tend to be more of a problem, cause more hospitalizations, cause more, uh, more likely to call poor, cause poor outcomes. Now, what about quality of life? Um, severe epistaxis, there have been a few studies looking at quality of life in HHT. The majority of them have used the SF36 form and not anything that's HHT specific. Uh, but based on the published literature, severe epistaxis is the most significant manifestation associated with poor quality of life in HHT patients. In a symptom-specific HHT questionnaire, 58% of patients with HHT reported their condition, th that their condition affected their quality of life and identified recurrent nosebleeds as being the major factor that negatively impacted work, social activities, as well as causing physiological strain. In one study uh, out of Spain, um, they looked, they administered the Euroqual 5D3L, so five dimensions over three across three levels, quality of life tool in 187 HHT patients over an eight year period and compared their results to that of the general population in Spain. And what they found was patients with HHT scored much higher um, on the quality of life, so greater impact on their quality of life. Uh, in, in almost all the, 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 the dimensions that were looked at, uh, mobility, daily activities, pain, anxiety, depression, uh, compared to the national Spanish population. That's not the only study. I've just put out here a few of the other studies that have looked at quality of life and published that there is a, uh, that quality of life is significantly affected uh, in patients with HHT. That's quality of life. What about mental health specifically? There are some data on that as well. Um, Chaturvedi and, and colleagues looked at it, conducted an exploratory survey based study that was a cross sectional study looking at the prevalence and determinants of depression and post traumatic stress disorder in individuals with HHT. This was in collaboration with Cure HHT and was conducted in 2015. Their survey had three components uh, they looked at baseline demographic data, including self-reported mental health diagnoses that were made by a physician. They then administered the PCL5, which is a screening tool for PTSD, and the Beck Depression Inventory 2, which, is, which screens for depression. 222 subjects um, responded to the survey, out of which 185 completed at least one of the mental health components, and, were, and those were the ones that were reported. Here is the, the general demographics of this population and, how, and the prevalence of uh, underlying mental health diagnoses in the responding population. Uh, and if you, this is interesting. If you look here at the, the, the Beck score for depression, uh, they had almost 80% of the respondents that, that screened as having mild, moderate, or severe depression. Um, and if you looked at PTSD, and here a score of 30, greater than 38 screens as presence of PTSD, almost 30% had PTSD. And on their analysis, they found a history of depression, anxiety, uh, and being unemployed were associated significantly with a positive PCL5 screen as well as a depression screen. So, so depression, PTSD, and other mental health disorders are also prevalent in people with HHT. What do we know about life expectancy? Now, this is a, an interesting questionnaire-based study that evaluated comorbidities as well as cause of death. So it was administered to 73 family members of deceased patients, looking at the cause of death, whether they thought the cause of death was related to HHT. And these were corroborated by looking at the medical records and reviewing them as well. Out of the 73, 55 cases were confirmed as having HHT, and those were the ones that were reported and they compared the cause of death to the cause of death in the general German population as of death statistics in 2015. And they reported that in HHT patients, um, the age at, uh, you know, at death was 65 overall compared to 80 in the general population. And that was both in men and women. When they look at the cause of death, they look, they divided it as the most, here are the most common causes in this pie chart uh, and whether they, and then they determined whether this was how likely this is to be disease related, HH related versus not. 
Um, and per the author's review of the records, they, they estimated that 51% of the cause of in 51% of patients, cause of death was at least probably or possibly related to HHT. And in 25% of cases, it most likely wasn't related to HHT. And if you look at the most common causes, bleeding, 100% likely related to HHT, lung AVMs, stroke, cardiopulmonary problems, CHF, sepsis, and cancer were the most common causes of death. Now, there are all other data looking at, at mortality in HHT as well. Uh, this is a paper by Donaldson that looked at outpatient database in the UK, where they looked at 675 patients with HHT compared to over 6,000 population matched controls. And they found the hazard ratio for death was 2.03 in people with HHT compared to the general population. And the median age of death was about three years younger in those with HHT compared to older, compared to the general population. Lastly, what about non-HHT related comorbidities that impact management of HHT? Hypertension is an age related comorbidity. Uh, poorly controlled hypertension can negatively impact HHT. Nosebleeds get worse in poorly controlled hypertension. If there is a brain AVM, the risk for stroke and hemorrhage from that is greater with poorly controlled hypertension. Management of cardiovascular disease in an HHT or any of the bleeding uh, disorder patient is quite difficult. How do we place these patients with coronary artery disease on aspirin, with stroke on aspirin, with atrial fibrillation on anticoagulation safely without making their bleeding worse? Likewise, management of orthopedic and other surgical procedures that is going to need some, some form of extended prophylactic anticoagulation to prevent uh, th thrombosis is a problem. Not to forget actual management of venous thromboembolism as well, which for which age is a risk factor, not to mention other comorbidities. So in closing, I, I hope I've made the case that HHT-related manifestations tend to worsen with age and that HHT impacts and is also impacted by the presence of non-HHT comorbidities and how well or poorly they're managed. HHT is associated with poor quality of life and also negatively impacts the mental health of affected individuals. And HHT, particularly in the setting of lack of care per published guidelines and screening, um, is associated with increased mortality. And I'd make the case that early diagnosis, improved access to care, increased awareness, and more funding for HHT research are all urgent and unmet needs at this moment. With that, I'm, this is a list of all of the HHT centers of excellence in North America. This is the concept of multidisciplinary HHT care at HHT centers of excellence was developed by the Cure HHT Foundation in collaboration with the Yale Center in 1991, and they're celebrating 30 years of HHT centers this year. Um, I highlighted Indiana and University of Michigan because those are HHT centers that are HTCs. Um, so HHT care is through their HTC at those sites as a part of a pilot program through the CDC. And my thanks to the entire HHT community, patients, families, all of the providers at HHT Centers of Excellence, as well as the CDC for all of their support and the Cure HHT Foundation for, for lifting the bulk of, of advocacy for HHT. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kasturi. Um, our first question that we have in the chat is, how is HHT diagnosed? Thank you. Um, HHT is diagnosed, you can do it one of two ways. You can do it with genetic testing, um, looking for mutations, pathogenic mutations in, in the three genes that are known to cause HHT. In a patient that meets enough clinical criteria, the coverage is, or the detection rate is upwards of 90, 85, 90%. So that's one way to do it with genetic testing. Uh, there are also clinical diagnostic criteria for, for HHT. There are four criteria. They're called the Curacao diagnostic criteria having multiple telangiectasias over mucocutaneous surfaces is one. Spontaneous recurrent nosebleeds is another. Having visceral organ AV malformations is the third, and having first-degree relative with HHT is the fourth. In people who have three or four out of four criteria, that's definite clinical HHT. Uh, in somebody with two, that's possible HHT. If it's less than two, it's HHT unlikely. So those are the two ways to diagnose HHT. Thank you. Um, another question, as you are working with patients and they are, they're aging, 
are there special steps that you take with them or ways that you counsel them on things that they can do or actions they can take to lower their risk of complications as they age? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, the one is to make sure that if at all possible, they're seen um, at least once a year or once every other year at an HHT Center of Excellence um, who can, and, and we, those of us at HHT Centers of Excellence work closely with the patient's primary care providers. We know access is a problem and we can't see them very frequently, but even if it's once a year or every other year, as long as we're involved, uh, we can at least worry about the HHT related things that need to be done proper screening to make sure that per guidelines to make sure that we're finding and appropriately treating any AVMs that these patients may have will prevent complications. Regular screening for anemia and iron deficiency, even without anemia, because they can be symptomatic even if they're not anemic, is important and appropriately and aggressively managing the iron deficiency and anemia is important. Uh, appropriate management of all of their comorbidities, get the blood pressure controlled well, uh, is important. And, and also making sure that you review their medications, that they're not on any medications that can actually increase their bleeding risk, that they're not taking any over-the-counter supplements that are going to increase bleeding risk. Um, the number of patients that I've taken off supplements like ginkgo and garlic uh, and, and made their nosebleeds better, but just something simple like that is, is, is enormous. So those things are important too. So that's what we do on a regular basis. We try and see all of our patients at least once a year stay on top of all of this to try and prevent complications, optimize their care. Outstanding. Another question, you mentioned that many patients move to long-term care after they've been hospitalized when they're aging. And do you find, are there resources or special trainings or things that are done for long-term care facilities that end up caring for um, a person who's aging who has HHT? Great question. It's it's actually an, an unmet need right now. We don't have a lot of data. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of education because it would be nice when an HHT patient is discharged to a long-term care facility that the people at that facility are oriented to some extent are given some idea about HHT and what they can expect um, and things that they should be mindful of, watchful for. Um, and that's a, that's a need right now. And it's it's uh, it's very under resourced and and there isn't anything special we do at this point that I'm aware of, and we don't at UNC, and I'm not aware of any other hospital that does it, but it's clearly in need. It's a resource issue. Outstanding. We have one final question for you, and this comes from me. So in my previous life before NHF, I also worked in the Alzheimer's and dementia space. And so I just wanted to ask, do you find any additional challenges with HHT patients who may develop cognitive decline that moves into dementia and Alzheimer's um, with regards to their care, maybe medications that create the complications. Um, you know, what, what sorts of things are, are there any relative overlap? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a great question. And again, there's, there's more work to be done here, but what we run into, so people with uh, liver AVMs that can develop as, people, as they age uh, with HHT, tend to have an encephalopathy that they develop that will also affect their cognitive function, right? So various aspects, just aging, um, dementia for other reasons, encephalopathy because of HHT, brain AVM related complications that can affect cognitive function all have an impact on, on, on day-to-day things. Um, a, a patient with HHT stops taking good care or stops caring for their nosebleeds like they have done all their life because all of a sudden as they're getting older because of encephalopathy or dementia, cognitive decline, are not able to do the things that they they're normally would do, not only to manage a nosebleed, but to prevent a nosebleed. There are things that we, we review with them to say, don't do this, don't do this. These are all things that can make a nosebleed worse. They know themselves, but with cognitive decline, it's like you're starting over you know, in, in some, of these, some of these patients. And, and that's a big challenge. Um, and, and we see that, not unfortunately, not uncommonly. So then I'm going to do a follow-up on question with that. Do you find then with those patients, as they start to lose their ability to follow through on their activities of daily living, do you have to bring in like their, their family members or their care provider to more appointments to kind of empower them to take a, a greater role in managing that um, disease for that per person? Yes, as much as possible, exactly. Because... Again, this becomes a, a resource issue. 
and, and health inequities factor into all of this as well. I don't want to digress into that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we rely entirely on families to help. Thankfully, because this is an inherited disorder, most of the family members are, are knowledgeable to some extent about this uh, and, and therefore are, are, are willing as, as best they are able to, to help. Um, but not everybody has the resources. So there's a, there's a big need there as well. All right, thank you, Dr. Chris Thury, very much for your presentation. Um, you. Next, we are going to have Kathleen Durst, who is a licensed clinical social worker um, working for Coley's Anemia Foundation, working with thalassemia patients. And she practices remotely um, in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. Today, Kathleen will be presenting on mental and emotional health challenges in aging thalassemia patients. Um, Kathleen, go ahead. Okay, one second. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, very happy to be here. So today I'm going to talk about um, quality of life, I, I, I call it, um, also mental health um, in aging thalassemia patients. Um, really, this is like my observations um, as the therapist at Cooley's Anemia Foundation, because there really isn't um, any data out there, no good data collection on our older thalassemia patients. So I'll discuss what I, what I see in our patients. Um, so, um, so my purpose today is to introduce myself, tell you a little bit about my role at Cooley's Anemia, um, and also give you a little bit about Cooley's. Um, Cooley's is a rare blood disorder, it's um, genetic, and basically my patients, um, their bodies don't pr produce enough of the proteins um, that would um, help them to develop red blood cells properly, so they, um, they need to get blood transfusions, uh, usually every two to three weeks, um, starting very early in life. And this is something that they will have for the rest of their life. Um, so it is a um, pretty intense um, medical routine that they have to go through, like I said, for the rest of their life. So it's really a, a family issue from the very beginning. Families have to really kind of pull together and manage their emotions about um, finding out and then kind of really manage their lives around it. So it's... Um, it's a lot that goes on. Um, so the, the reason why I was brought into Cooley's anemia 13 years ago was um, the idea that certainly this is gonna have an impact on quality of life with the patients. So I started um, basically just kind of calling the patients from the start, introducing myself and um, you know, kind of trying to figure out how can I really help them you know, remotely. And remote work as a therapist wasn't really um, done, you know, back then. So my intention today is to really just to describe our program in general, the quality of life program that I've put together, and then specifically show you what I'm doing with um, my older patients and how I see aging impacting them and what I want to do more of um, to help them. So in our quality of life program, we have our patient services director, Eileen Scott. So she's the mom of a thalassemia patient. Her daughter is now in her 30s. She has two children. So she is doing well and thriving. Um, Eileen is there and she does kind of more of like the concrete services. She helps out with um, insurance issues. She helps out if there's any appeals letters that need to be written, um, medication, things that might come up. Um, and she just kind of knows the whole community because she's been there for a long time. So she's an amazing resource. Um, I have um, one to two social work interns from Boston University, their remote program. So they are social workers in training. So they work remotely. So that's a nice like extra 32 hours that, um, that we're getting of, um, of students uh, to help us. And one of our students was just part of our, um, our patient and family conference that we have every year. So that was great. Um, I'm licensed in four states, so I can do psychotherapy in those four states with our patients, which I certainly do quite a bit of. Um, and they obviously have to be in those, in those states that I'm licensed in. So I do individual services, I do group services. Um, the groups that we do is we have a 50s plus group that's led by one of our patients. So something I felt strongly about after I was working at the foundation for a while is that 
I can only do so much. Um, and the power of the patient or the peer led um, power was very strong. That became very clear to me. It's actually a pretty um, cohesive group, um, the patients and families. Um, we kind of call it like the coolies family. And um, it works really well if a patient's leading the group. And I'm, of course, there to bring information to the group and then be available or be on call if any mental health issues arise during the group. We have a um, 20s to 35 group led by a 25 year old patient. We're starting a My Mood group led by, that will be led by a 29 year old patient. She just started taking an SSRI and she is getting a tremendous um, benefit from it. She just said she, her life feels so much better. She's able to manage her treatments and not look at everything as, as, it's, as if it's so incredibly difficult. So her um, cognitions have shifted um, and she's also doing CBT work. So it's really benefited her and she wants to share that with everyone else. And then I do a, um, a weekly meditation and mindfulness um, group as well. So the services are focused on adherence to treatment, uh, making sure they go to their yearly exams, transition, which is a big one, you know, really more or less recently. So the patients that I have who are my older patients, the ones who are like 50 plus, their parents were told that they would probably not live beyond their teen years. Um, right now, I think we have about 1,200 um, patients on our registry here in America, and we have about 61 patients aged 51 and above, but our, our patients are, are stronger. Our patients are healthier, they're having babies, they're moving through, and now they're transitioning to adult clinics. Um, they're seeking fertility help or just fertility counseling, which is something I didn't see 13 years ago when I started. Um, I focus on care coordination, making sure that the patients are, you know, communicating with all of their providers and that their parents are doing that in the beginning. And then hopefully that the patients, as they get older, continue to do that and, and also take things in their own hands and become independent with their medical care as they move forward. I help them with their blood reactions. And this piece of support for family and home, um, like in the last presentation, that becomes a really, really big area of focus for me with my older patients because they need their families, they need their friends, they need that group. So as they get older, to take care of them as a resource, whether it's for financial planning or anything, and certainly at, at times of emergencies. I do have patients, of course, that don't have family. Either they had parents, the parents only had one child because they found out about the condition and they didn't wanna have any more children. And so their parents have passed away. And many times, our families can live a more limited um, life and maybe not, not expand, not open up so much and tell a lot of people about the condition. So there may not be a lot of um, social resources. So I really emphasize the need to, um, to be open to the resources in their communities. And we use like the thalassemia community as one base, but then to try to um, strengthen them with all the rest of the resources. Um, this is another example of one of our groups. We put together a group about remembering the past of 2020, um, just so everyone can, you know, kind of have an opportunity to talk about what was going on for them. I really encourage the expression of, it can be just telling their story. It can be expression of emotions if they you know, lost somebody. But, um, but that is a, a big emphasis um, that I have for sure. This is Priyanka, she is um, 25 and she runs our 20s plus group. So she's really excited and she was at our um, patient conference and she's also gonna do a group for the kids. So she met a bunch of kids at the conference, they clicked with her and then now we're gonna start the Zoom groups with her. Um, I just wanna mention a lot of these groups that we're doing, it's taken quite a while to get them started. We had a lot of starts and stops and people's schedules and different things like that, but the power of it is tremendous. And I'm really seeing it in the 50s plus group. This is our child life specialist at the conference. That's a little girl that came up to her mom and said, mom, mom, there's somebody like me here. It was the first time she ever met um, somebody else with thalassemia. So that's 
what I like to show my patients on a, a, a lot just to be able to like relax and, um, and calm down and try to meditate and breathe as much as possible. So yes, our patients are getting older, which is amazing and so exciting, right? They're transitioning. We never thought we'd have an issue with transition to um, adult care. Um, so I'm doing a lot more of the psychotherapy um, to help them. You know, I use evidence-based interventions, CBT, that's cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal psychotherapy, motivational interviewing, mindfulness and dialectical behavioral therapy um, to just to really give skills. Like I, I definitely am a therapist that likes to process. Like I was saying earlier, just it's good to process and speak about your story, but also let's build a lot of skills so that they can even be their own therapist. Cause I'm only one person, you know, there I'm trying to build this team, but, um, you know, I want, I want the patients to be able to, um, to kind of try to take care of themselves, but certainly there's the power of getting a lot of help. So this is the beginning of our, um, our 50s plus group and our Zoom. Um, it started out slowly and I'm gonna show you some of this information that we, we always write like a summary after the group. Um, when we started like, in, I think we started in like April or something like that, but this is in May and um, they got together and they were basically talking about medical stuff, you know, and this is ages. So there's four participants and their ages like 50. I think the oldest one was like 62 and a lot of focus on medical because many of them, they, they're, they're getting different treatments and they love to compare that, you know, the different medical things that are going on. Um, you're talking about the different medical staffs and it, it definitely provides a lot of relief for them to talk about things like that. They continue to talk about, you know, medical, um, they provided you know, support for each other. They all know when they're each other's going to see a doctor or a family member's gonna see a doctor. So they're supporting each other on that. Um, issues with chelation, different things like that. And then I really, I realized recently that they're starting to really talk about their emotions. <clears throat> this one, this last group, they were talking about the knowledge of them being like the oldest generation of those you know, with the disease. So that they're really kind of getting more into that. They're talking about how they really built the foundation and um, you know, they're feeling very empowered and feeling very part of, of all that. So certainly I'm seeing quite a bit of depression, anxiety, PTSD, similar to the last presentation. Um, and I'm using those different interventions. You know, they're, the pain that's increasing with age is really, really significant. Um, the, the fatigue I'm seeing is significant. Um, they're having more doubt. There's certainly like more frustration, worry about being able to get to transfusions, um, you know, being able to just sort of manage on their own. You know, some, some of the older patients take like a bus all the way down to Cornell, like from Chinatown and, and back with, and their bones are beginning to get very um, brittle and, and, you know, the pain with the bone as well. Um, they're still kind of reluctant to, to go too much into the future stuff and, and, and go there um, too, too much, but we, we definitely go there. I just find that it's certainly something that they, they it feels way more comfortable to stay away from that. Many have not made a will. Um, I see quite a bit of anger, um, especially when they weren't treated well when they were younger. However, I do see like a very intense strength and resilience um, they don't want to be a burden to others. And they just, they, there really is this like tough kind of independence in my 50 plus um, patients that I see. So I kind of think that that strength that they develop throughout their life of having this condition, because many of them, and I see this in my younger patients too, they don't want to burden their parents and they want, don't want their parents to worry so they do have kind of maybe an overcompensation of I'm okay, I can do this, I can take care of myself. I'm seeing that in them still as they're older and I would like them to be a little bit more vulnerable and ask for help and be open to the help that's available and be realistic so that we can set things up for you know, whatever you know, the future will be. You know, we've not had a patient go into a nursing home yet because we haven't had patients that old. So I don't know what that's going to be like, um, you know, but definitely it, it's an area that, that we need to look into and we need to be ready for. 
Um, so with, with age comes diabetes, cardiac issues, and all these just get worse and worse, endocrine issues, bones are breaking easily. Many of my patients, their doctors will give them a hug and they'll break their ribs, they'll break some of their, their bones, they're, they're very fragile. They don't have a spleen, they may need blood more often. Um, and then their families who were taking care of them are getting older and are passing away. Um, so some of the things that, that we need is certainly a really solid insurance um, system at Cooley's so that we can get ready, um, get, get the families ready like early too um, on, with insurance and what benefits there are and what foundations can help them. So that's a little bit clearer. You know, when it's national, as, as you all know, it's very difficult because state to state things are so different. Um, I'm really putting technology into place to help with medical and emotional care. So I've got a lot of apps that I um, recommend like the Headspace and Calm. And there's a lot of mental health apps that are very helpful, mental health apps that have coaches. So that I think can, I have to get funding for it, but that can substitute perhaps the work that I'm doing. I think that the groups are always be important because they need to connect with others with thalassemia and find out like how they're managing um, and get the motivation. Um, like I said, go back to educating from birth, um, educating parents from the very beginning, perhaps doing it in the hospitals, at least start at the treatment centers, um, take advantage of the resources in their communities. Um, so educate them in that and maybe go in and do a little bit of training in the hematology clinics on some basic CBT interventions or um, different interventions that can be done um, with the patients uh, at that level. Patients who, let's say, don't get to me or, or you know, can't get any kind of care. So trying to get to them and, and provide more information. Um, in addition, I was gonna say, we also have a, have a pain group that we do once a month and that's been very good. And we, we put made that for younger and older patients because they just had such different, different um, levels of pain and things to talk about. Um, so this is a pediatric condition that is now um, becoming, you know, a pediatric through life condition, which is the good news. Um, but as my patients get older, they are definitely, the symptoms physically are exacerbated and mentally, emotionally, definitely are getting, um, you know, more intense. So um, I thank you for your time. Outstanding. Thank you so much um, for sharing this information with us. And we have just a couple of questions for you. Um, first, you know, as you were sharing your information, um, I, I was struck by the, the, you know, Im the impact of the fact that you have this oldest population who did not expect to have the life expectancy they've had thus far and just what that can do mentally to a person as they're thinking about the unknown there aren't people ahead of them who've charted these waters do you find that any of the people who are living with thalassemia expressing that they might have done things differently along the way if they had known that they could have a longer life expectancy than what they've had so far oh definitely i hear a lot, and I think this plays into some of the more intense depression. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of patients didn't take care of themselves um, when they were younger. They didn't take their chelator or they stopped for long periods of time. And right, they, they, they were told they may not live past their teen years. So they, they also didn't go to college, uh, many of them, or maybe they went to just a couple of years. They just didn't have that dream or future oriented kind of view. And I think that was a whole other piece that, yeah, I hear a lot of regret, a lot of regret. And do you find that as your um, patients are aging, are there steps that they are taking to be able to advocate for their changing health? Because like you mentioned, the things that come with it, like diabetes and chronic heart conditions and, and the complications that can happen when you have comorbidities. So mm -hmm. do you work with them directly on how they can advocate when they go in, say to their primary care or specialist or the ER and um, you know, need to identify the, the multiple things that are happening? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. So um, if needed, and I've done this a lot, um, I'll call the doctors and speak to the doctors and explain to them, send them the standards of care. Um, 
you know, try to try to really beef up that care coordination because I think that's that's very very important so that the you know the primary care doctors understand what's going on in hematology and then the hematology understands that they are going to the, their PCP to get you know their basic health taken care of. You know the um, the younger when the patients were younger they relied on their pediatric their pediatric hematologists to take care of everything or the nurses and so going to a PCP is actually a whole new concept for certainly the patients in their 20s who are kind of transitioning out, but even there's a lot of, of hospitals who are keeping the patients till they're like 40 or 50 even. Um, and so they've never had a PCP. So they've really never coordinated their own care. So I do a lot of that, yeah. Well, Matt, I have a follow-up question on that. So mm -hmm. that reminds me of, you know, some of the other conditions that I'm familiar with, for example, you know, I've heard that if a patient has, you know, a different condition where they're typically don't live past a certain age that then pediatricians that specialize in that condition end up providing adult care because there just aren't mm. very many adult specialists right. to do that. Do you find that happening? Or do you have patients who end up having to stick with a pediatrician as an adult just because in their area, they're the only one who's well-informed? Right, I haven't had a pediatrician, but definitely the pediatric hematologist. Um, I've not heard, but I'm sure, I'm sure it exists, you know? Because if, especially if you're in a small area, why not? They have a relationship with the parents. They've helped them from probably sometimes birth on, you know, when they first got the diagnosis. So it, it, I'm sure it happens, yeah. So we have a question also from chat. Um, how do you communicate with your HTC that you feel these symptoms, even though your levels aren't that bad, according to them? What is, I don't understand the question. Um, I think, is that about yeah, thalassemia? I believe so. <laughs> so I'd be asking about if a patient um, doesn't feel their symptoms, how do they communicate their symptoms to their, their treatment center? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I think they're, um, they're expressing, you know, I, for my, what I'm getting is they're expressing that their HTC might not be um, listening to their symptoms as, as well as they would like them to. I see, I see. Okay, well, um, what I would say to my patients is try to find, you know, go through a couple of different things. Try to find if there's somebody there who they feel listens or might understand a little bit better. Always go with another person you know, to your appointments. Um, and if needed, I mean, I know that's hemophilia, but like I, with with coolies, I would say if needed, I would make I would make a phone call. I mean, I talk to the um, hematology clinics all the time, and I happen like the treatment centers. I happen to know all the nurses. We're on like a monthly nurses call anyway, so it is kind of a small, tighter community. Um, but I would say advocate, and if if you have the person who's asking the question, if they have a therapist of some sort have them reach out and, and set up something or maybe um, look at the way you're communicating and maybe there's a, a clear way to explain it. I mean, I think it, I think it can definitely happen because I see that happening a lot. That's a really good question. Great. Thank you. And I have one more for you. So mm -hmm. um, multi-part. So you're talking about, you know, being able to provide mental health services through telemedicine and distance mm -hmm. type things um, with families across state lines. And so, mm -hmm. Are you able, let's say, um, if I was the patient and my family member lived in a different state, would you still be able to include them in the call to provide that mental health support as long as the patient is in the payer connection state that you're licensed in so that you could bring in, you know, like um, a, an additional family member for that mental health support on the telemedicine mm -hmm. call to you know, yeah, know, you know the, that's interesting. So the patients in the state I'm licensed in, but their family members in a different state. I mean, I would think I probably would check my, my board, but I would think that that would absolutely be fine. I've never done it. So, I've never, but I would think that would be fine because that wouldn't be my patient. So that would be right. the, the family member. So I would, I would think that that would be absolutely fine, but I would, I, I can easily and, check that. And are you finding that with the aging patients as, I mean, you know, as people start to age, that they're starting to be a little more willing to bring in family members to help support that mental health component and advocate for them? Or are you having to really encourage people as they're aging to lean on family and, and be okay with asking for that mental health support? 
I feel like I have to encourage them and really work on it. If, if I think it's, it's, I think I find it to be kind of two ways, either the family's involved and they're pretty close and it's good. And then I can, I can do that work or there's some problems in the relationships and they don't want to include that person. And they've had a lot of difficulties and I'll have to really go in there and try to encourage them to see if I can get a phone number and then call the brother or call whoever it is to, to engage them. Cause some of them only have like one relative and, or in their, they're by themselves and they have, might have one relative who they don't talk to. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so You're much welcome. for sharing this information. Really appreciate it. Sure. Um, next, our next presenter is going to be Miriam Goldstein, who is a lawyer and serves as the Director of Policy at the Hemophilia Federation of America. She is presenting on Aging with a Bleeding Disorder, Medicare 101. Miriam, go ahead. Thank you, Marcy. Um, and, and many thanks to my friends at NHF for including me in this, in this program. Um, sorry, I, here we go. Um, so I am very happy to be here to give a very whirlwind introduction to getting started to, with Medicare for people with bleeding disorders. Um, as a quick review of what we'll talk about today, we'll talk a little bit about just really best about the history and general structure of Medicare, because that helps shed some light on what the choices are, what the what Medicare covers and what it doesn't. There are definitely pitfalls for the unwary in Medicare. And so knowing where those are and how to avoid them is key. And then we'll talk about some special considerations for people with waiting disorders to bear in mind when they become eligible for Medicare. So I think everyone is pretty much aware that Medicare is health insurance for seniors, though it also covers um, some younger people with permanent disabilities and special specified illnesses. It's very popular as insurance among its users, especially to people with bleeding disorders who may have spent a lifetime really fighting to get and maintain coverage. So it can come as a relief to know, hey, I'm Medicare eligible. Here is a defined path to coverage that um, will be available to me. But it is complicated due to the program's history and to its structure. So with respect to its history, it's, it's over 50 years old, but it took two decades worth of fighting and work and political compromise to, to put Medicare in place in 1965. And at its origin, it was really focused on providing coverage to seniors for acute illness and hospitalization. But things have changed in the decades since Medicare was enacted. Additional populations have been added and crucially lifespans have increased, um, medical science has advanced. So now Medicare covers 61 million Americans and a lot of the Medicare program focuses on preventive care, chronic condition management. So there's the history. The structure is also complicated. We talk about Medicare as a singular, but it's really several distinct um, programs all under the, the one name or rubric of Medicare. So we have this fragmentation, we have complete, and that gives rise to complexity and some troubling gaps in coverage. And for any of us who have helped a parent um, with their Medicare, really the complexity of the program, given that it is for seniors, is kind of mind boggling. So we talked about how it's kind of uh, a bunch of different programs all in one. Um, and the, the four basic parts of Medicare are parts A, B, C, and D, with part A focused on that initial focus of hospitalization, acute care, inpatient care. So that's in hospitals, it's in skilled nursing facilities, which Marla's gonna talk about, and in settings like um, hospice. Part B is basically all the other medical care. That's doctor services, it's specialist services, it's lab work, it's outpatient care. Um, 
crucially, it is also um, Part B covers a category of services known as doctor administered drugs. And that's where bleeding disorder injectables are covered. Even though many people in the bleeding disorders community keep those products at home, self-administer those products, bleeding disorders products are covered under Part B. And I will come back to this point over and over again. I apologize in advance, but it is something um, it, it's not unique to bleeding disorders. Cancer drugs are also covered in Part B, but it makes the needs of a bleeding disorders, um, a person with a bleeding disorder, very unique and very specific as they make their Medicare choices. Part D is um, kind of the latest addition to Medicare, and that is prescription drug coverage for the drugs you buy at a drugstore. So not your, your, not your bleeding disorder injectables, but any, more or less any other drugs that you may need. Part C, I know I, I, know I didn't go in order of the alphabet. Part C is, is different. It's a different way of getting your Medicare benefit. And that's by more or less opting out of original Medicare and choosing to get your coverage from a private plan that looks like uh, commercial insurance plans that you may have uh, been covered by prior to Medicare age. And we'll, we'll look at Part C or Medicare Advantage a little later. So getting started with Medicare, some people will get Medicare automatically, typically if you are already receiving Social Security benefits. If you are not yet receiving Social Security benefits when you turn 65 or are approaching your 65th birthday, you may have to take proactive steps to sign up for Medicare. And you may be able to postpone signing up if you are still working or you're still covered by a spouse's workplace plans. The details here really, really matter. So um, you have to work closely with your HR department to make sure you have all your ducks in a row if you are considering postponing signing up for Medicare because you are covered by workplace coverage. And the reason is that one of the pitfalls for the unwary is that deadlines really matter in Medicare. And if you do not sign up when you are first eligible, you may end up paying a penalty in the form of higher premiums for the rest of your life, which is substantial. When you get started with Medicare, you have a threshold decision to make, which is, are you going to go the pathway of original Medicare, or are you going to look at private coverage via a Medicare Advantage plan? So original Medicare are the boxes shown in yellow because there are some gaps which we'll talk about. So if you go the original Medicare route, you're going to want to get supplemental coverage. And Medicare Advantage is the path marked in green. And we'll take a closer look at both of those. So original Medicare. That's the parts A and B for hospitalization and for outpatient medical services. We'll take a look at some of the costs, coverage, and where the gaps arise. For part A coverage under original Medicare, most people pay zero dollars in monthly premiums. If you or a spouse have worked for 10 years, you have had deductions from your pay during that time, and that is considered to be you paying into the Medicare system. So zero premiums for most for Part A. But there are deductibles and co-pays and co-insurance if you end up being hospitalized. And um, there's an annual deductible. Um, of almost $1,500. These are all 2021 figures. The numbers do change, typically go up a little bit from year to year. But there can be quite eye-popping co-insurance and co-pays for hospitalizations beyond 61 days. And I think none of us wants to contemplate the prospect of being hospitalized for more than two months in a year. But you do need to know that there is a significant potential for financial exposure if you would, um, need lengthy hospitalization under original Medicare. 
on the Part B side, so that's the medical and outpatient services and your bleeding disorders injectable products, there's a monthly premium, which is the same for most people. Some higher income people will pay a little bit more than this, but so roughly $150 a month. There's a pretty modest annual deductible. But the key thing to know about Part B is that under original Medicare, there is coinsurance of 20% a year with no out-of-pocket maximum. And since the bleeding disorders products are covered under Part B, we all in the bleeding disorders community can do the math and know how fast that coinsurance amount could rise and basically how unaffordable it would be. So that's clearly one of the really important gaps um, that I talked about with original Medicare. There is substantial out-of-pocket exposure for long-term hospitalization and in Medicare Part B with that 20% coinsurance. And that is where the bleeding disorders products are covered. But there are some other gaps too. Um, Medicare doesn't cover hearing, dental, or vision benefits. Um, Congress is right now discussing whether they can, can find the resources to include some of those benefits in Medicare as they um, consider a health reform package right now. Uh, it would be very popular and there's a, you know, considerable agreement that it would be good to have coverage for those benefits in Medicare, but right now it does not exist. And original Medicare doesn't cover those prescription drugs that you get at the drugstore. So to fill those gaps um, for the financial exposure and the, the need for coverage for prescription drugs, you would look at supplemental coverage and a Part D prescription drug plan. These supplements you may have also heard referred to as Medigap. These are um, supplemental policies sold by private health insurance carriers that supplement original Medicare Part A and B. Medigap plans are really the only way to get comprehensive coverage within original Medicare and protect yourself against those um, cost sharing amounts, including the 20% coinsurance on bleeding disorder products. Medigap plans come in 10 standardized plan designs identified by letter. So basically a, a Medigap plan G is going to look the same across all issuers. And a key thing to know about Medigap plans is that there is something called guaranteed issue during your initial window of eligibility. So when you first become eligible for Medicare by virtue of aging into it, but in most states, after that initial window of eligibility, Medigap plans can medically underwrite. That means they can charge you more based on your age and based on your health condition. Um, so a, a key fact to bear in mind. What Medigap policies aren't and what they don't do is they're not compatible with Medicare Advantage, that Medicare Part C that we've kind of postponed talking about, and they're not compatible with retiree plans from your employer or union. You have to have Medicare A and B in order to get a Medigap plan. They don't cover couples. So if both spouses are eligible for Medicare, you may each need to get your own Medigap plan. They don't cover dental, vision, and hearing or long-term care, which no Medicare plans do. So that particular gap remains open. And generally, Medigap plans don't cover Part D prescription drugs, so your drugstore meds. Um, so if you go the Medigap route, route you would also need to get a Part D prescription drug plan. The Part D plans come with different formularies and at different price points, and the formularies change from year to year. There is an open enrollment period in the fall for Part D prescription drug plans, and you can switch um, at that point and make sure that the drugs that you need coverage for are, are covered by your particular Part D plan. 
they do come with this complicated built-in coverage gap called a donut hole. The Affordable Care Act narrowed it, but basically if you spend past roughly $4,000 in Part D drugs, you hit a period where you have to spend, pay a little more, and then you reach the other end of the donut hole and your co-pays go down. Again, bleeding disorders, injectables are covered under Part B, not Part D. Um, but if you anticipate ever requiring drugs in addition to your bleeding disorder product, you need Part D coverage as well as Part B. And here again, you need to sign up in your initial window of eligibility or else you pay more for the rest of your life. So again, getting started with Medicare, we talked about original Medicare, the, the route marked in yellow, we're gonna turn to talk about Medicare Advantage or Part C, the route marked in green. So again, Medicare Advantage are private insurance plans. It's just an entirely different way of getting your Medicare benefit. Basically, um, the money that the government would spend on your Medicare benefit is assigned to the private health insurer that you select to manage your care. Um, the plan can look like an HMO or a PPO, like one of the plans you may be familiar with from your pre um, retirement life. Medicare Advantage plans can offer extra benefits, um, and right now they're heavily um, advertised on TV because we're approaching the Medicare fall open enrollment. So um, they, they, do, uh, they can offer um, hearing, vision, dental, they offer gym memberships sometimes. Um, so, so that's a plus, there are extra benefits. The trade-off is that you have to stay within a defined network of providers, and it might be quite narrowly defined. In terms of spending, there is a cap on um, out-of-pocket spending for your Part A and Part B services if you go to a Medicare Advantage plan. But that cap can be high. In 2021, it could be as high as $7,550 and you are not eligible to buy a Medigap plan to cover these costs if you are, are um, going the Medicare Advantage route. You should also know your Part D spending does not uh, count towards this total. Depending on where you live, there may be multiple plans available. There are also some counties and in some states where there are no Medicare Advantage plans available. Um, the Medicare.gov website has a plan finder where you can put in your area and see what plans are available in your area. There are some uh, $0 premium plans ex that exist, but um, even if you're in one of those plans, you still have to pay the Medicare Part B premium. So again, that was almost $150 a month. And when you use your insurance, Coinsurance and copays exist in Medicare Advantage, just as in Medicare or original Medicare. And so Part B drugs, your bleeding disorders, injectables, typically have 20% coinsurance. So you know how quickly that 20% coinsurance could, um, could mount up and you could be facing that maximum out-of-pocket limit uh, that could be as high as $7,550. And then Part D uh, drugs have copays depending on their tier. So there are a lot of factors to, to weigh as you, you make this threshold decision of original Medicare versus Medicare Advantage. Um, cost of premiums obviously is of concern. But you have to think about coverage. Um, both kinds of plans will cover basic medical care. Medicare Advantage offers the extra benefits. You have to think about those out-of-pocket costs. Um, a 20% copay or coinsurance um, for bleeding disorders products in both Medicare Advantage and in Original Medicare. In Original Medicare, you can get a Medigap plan to help cover that. 
for the other prescription drugs. Uh, original Medicare, you would have to get a separate Part D plan. A lot of Medicare Advantage plans roll that Part D benefit into the Part C plan. Doctor and hospital choice under Original Medicare, you can go to any doctor that accepts Medicare. Whereas with Medicare Advantage, you are limited to the plan's network. You may have to get prior authorization to see a specialist. Um, and networks change from year to year. So your provider might be in network one year, but you have to switch plans to, to keep going to your provider the next year. If travel is part of your retirement plans, um, that, that difference between narrow networks and broad networks may, may push you in one direction versus another. And crucially, thinking about how your needs may change over time. For a lot of young retirees, you know, those gym memberships and other um, extra benefits are very attractive. But there are some studies that show that as people age or as their medical condition becomes more complicated, there is um, sometimes less satisfaction with Medicare Advantage um, because it's harder to get the specialized care that people want. And unfortunately, it can be hard to undo that choice because the Medigap plans may not be available when you're older, when you're sicker, because of medical underwriting. So a couple of big picture takeaways. That's a lot of very detailed technical information. So what are some of the big picture takeaways? Deadlines are important. That, that failure to sign up during your window of eligibility can dog you for the rest of your life and cost you more in uh, the form of penalties uh, that take the form of higher premiums that continue for the rest of your life. Take the long view. Don't think, think about what you'll need, not just this year, you know, not just when you're turning 65, but as you age, because of that fact that some choices once made are hard to unmake, and specifically that um, that difficulty in accessing Medigap coverage as you age or as you live with the bleeding disorder. Um, Part D coverage, you don't use other drugs now, that is great, but the chances are you may as you age. And if you do not get Part D plan when you're first eligible, it will cost you more of it. Make sure you are protected against potentially ruinous out of pocket costs, including the 20% coinsurance for your bleeding disorders uh, product. Uh, if you're going the original Medicare route, you need supplemental Medicap coverage. There is, um, there are some programs that help people based on lower income. Um, some people will be eligible for Medicaid, for Medicare extra help, but those are income dependent. There's some charitable nonprofit assistance, but please be aware that the manufacturer copay assistance that so many of us use to help afford our drugs cannot generally be used in Medicare. Um, so you can't go in and assume that you will be able to use uh, manufacturer provided copay assistance. And knowledgeable help is available. Um, your HTC social worker is likely a, a wonderful source of information. Your HR department, if you're thinking about postponing that enrollment decision. And free unbiased assistance is available through state health insurance assistance programs, um, otherwise known as SHIPS. They, they just go by different names of different states, but you can find your state SHIP um, at shiphelp.org or going to the Medicare um, website. So that was kind of a breakneck pace, um, but I think I will stop sharing and um, see if there are any questions. Thank you, Miriam. That was outstanding. Um, I have a few questions that are in here for you. Um, so one of the first questions was, you talked about how, you know, if patients can't afford the coverage, especially if they're trying to get Medigap and things, that there are some provisions and some organizations that can help. Um, are, 
if their if their situation changes over time, so you know their financial situation maybe is precarious, but just above the support at the beginning, but over time because of their changing medical needs and costs, will they be able to enroll or access those programs later, or is that support only eligible when they're signing up? No, I, that uh, that support um, they can come back to as their circumstances change. Okay, great. Um, and then another question is, you know, that that time window is obviously very specific. Um, do the HTCs or the social workers or different people help warn people and alert them um, as they're coming into that window that it is such a tight window and you know really kind of stay on them to get them to to enroll? Because I know you know for some people living with um, different medical conditions, there can just be a lot in managing your daily health, let alone thinking about paperwork and all of those things. Absolutely, it's a lot to keep track of. And like I said, the complexity is really um, a major downside to, I, I feel like a system that's supposed to serve seniors that is so complex and has so many um, potential wrong turns that are hard to come back from is, is kind of not, not really acceptable. So, um, but this is where we are. Um, as Kathleen was saying, you know, the, the um, it, it's kind of wonderful that we now have a community aging into Medicare because for way too long that was not the case. So I think, you know, I, I think the social workers are, because they are wonderful people, they are, you know, educating themselves and, and learning how to, to be knowledgeable guides through this process. Um, the, the ship resources really are, are excellent also. Um, what I would caution is, you know, if you are going to a ship and, and the people I have dealt with at the ships have uniformly been really knowledgeable and, um, but it's incumbent on you if you're living with a bleeding disorder to, to at least know the basic fact, like know that your product is covered under Part B. Because if you go to um, just a, a general purpose advisor and say, I need prescription drug coverage, they're gonna think about Part D. And, and everyone needs Part D, but for someone with a bleeding disorder, honing in on Part B, as in boy, and the protection against the, the you know, unlimited coinsurance is really a key consideration for anyone with a blending disorder. Outstanding. Um, we have an initial question. So as you're looking at individuals and they're they're trying to figure this out and you know the cost of the, the medications and the treatments and things, um, do you find or have you heard if are there ever patients who end up choosing a different route with their treatment because of financial need and how the, the coverage has changed when they move into their co-insurances? Um, we've definitely gotten phone calls from people, you know, unfortunately, who fall into some of these pitfalls for the unwary. So um, someone who signs up for a Medicare Advantage plan because they talk to their hospital not their HTC, and it turns out that there's, you know, the satellite site where they, where their HTC is located is not, um, is, is not a network, or they didn't know about that um, potential out of pocket, but that they would have to pay coinsurance on their Part B drug up to um, their out of pocket maximum. And Marla sent me a note that she would she would love to jump in. And I would love to hear what she has to say here. Um, hi. I just didn't want to, you know, jump in and um, steal the show. No, just kidding. Um, so I think I think what is super important here, which Miriam brings up, is that it, this twenty percent is untapped, right? It's twenty percent until you die. So there's no sort of you know, stopgap, if you will, for that 20%. What the problem we see a lot of people um, worry and focus solely on part B as in boy, right? And then they find out that when they need their pain meds, 
or when they had they need their HIV meds, those are covered under Part D, as in dog. And they're like, well, I don't have a Part D. And I'm like, well, first of all, right, there's several um, issues with that. Like, I think people both are myopic in, in, in worrying about their bleeding disorder coverage and sort of forget that all the, you know, you're aging. I mean, as you age, you're going to take more and more medication. So that's going to become a bigger proportion of your drug utilization, if you will. Right. And I think it's always hard to sort of predict how you're going to age and what you're going to age into and so forth that, that, it's best to be overprotected when you age as opposed to under underprotected or underinsured. And if you can afford it, right, you really, really, there's no reason that you should have to pay that 20%, right? Because there are programs, sorry, we're having a really bad thunderstorm right now. Um, there are programs through Medicare that do cover that 20%. So we, we don't like it. But when, you know, people are like, I have to pay 20%. And I'm like, well, why did you get, you know, a, a part, <laughs> you know, a Medicare plan or a part, you know, or a Medicare Advantage plan? Oh, I didn't, I didn't need part D because I worried about factor. And I'm like, well, we're telling you now, and you should really, you know, be broad up with respect to what you know, you're going to happen. And if you're on heart medication or cholesterol medication, that those are all part D drugs. And while the trade-offs are high, you just want to be mindful that these gaps exist and, you know, Medicare knows they exist and Medicare knows that they're expensive and they're trying to fill those gaps in the best way they can. But, you know, we always say that healthcare isn't free. It's not free for anybody. So um, whether it's private or public insurance, it's always sort of hard to gauge the affordability, especially for those on a fixed income, right? And I think for a lot of people, as Kathleen mentioned, it's a good problem to have. I mean, you know, people are naturally, our community is naturally aging into Medicare. And I think um, a lot of people didn't financially plan for that, right? So they didn't sort of put aside financial resources and planning about, you know, how they were gonna age into their golden years, if you will. So I think it's, you know, it's a mixed bag. And what we're trying to do is educate more people about you have a normal lifespan, you need to plan, right? <laughs> you have a normal lifespan. Now you really, really need to plan accordingly and make sure that those costs are in fact covered. And if it means holding, you know, more back of your income and putting it more of it um, aside, then that's kind of what you have to do. Outstanding, thank you. We have one last question for you, Miriam. Um, this person wrote, Medigap carriers seem to be cherry picking their insureds and become very expensive, unaffordable for some, especially after the age of 75 when premiums can be over $300 monthly. Is anything being done to make Medigap premiums affordable for all? Any legislative actions? I don't know of legislative, well, I take that back. So the, the questioner, you know, highlights the fact that Medigap can medically underwrite. So with this idea of it's more expensive for over 75, yes, it's more expensive for over 75. That's why you need to get in when you are first eligible when they can't medically underwrite. Um, there has been some legislative interest in um, expanding guaranteed issue opportunities in Medigap and in, in making, making it additional opportunities where you can enter the Medigap like if you were in Medicare Advantage and it's not working for you and you want to switch back to Medicare, original Medicare plus Medigap in our community, that would be really hard. You'd have advancing age, plus you have a, a whopper of a pre-existing health condition. So there is some legislative interest in expanding the guaranteed issue opportunities, the times when people can get into Medigap without having their health and age counted against them. What I can't tell you is how likely that is to pass. Um, it would be expensive. And Congress is considering a whole bunch of very pricey health expansions right now, and they are going to leave some on the cutting room floor. You, Marla, do you have, do you agree or? 
I agree. I think I think Medicare, right? I mean, currently what I just read was that the dental plan is being contested by the American Dental Association. So go figure, right? Because there's always going to be some some barrier that you know is unexpected. Like the AMA originally, you know, blocked Medicare, right? Because they didn't want to um, to take Medicare reimbursement rates. So there's always going to be something. So as as beneficial and, and and as much of a public good a dental or vision plan would be rolled into Medicare, there's always going to be some legislative obstacle. Which you're like, what? The American Dental Association is against having giving people dental insurance. So it's you know it's always a kind of an unexpected turn that you wouldn't you know necessarily expect. Outstanding. Well, thank you very, very much, Miriam, for, for your presentation and your information. Um, next, we are going to be moving into Marla Feinstein's presentation. Uh, Marla is the Senior Policy and Healthcare Analyst at the National Hemophilia Foundation. Today, she will be presenting on access to skilled nursing facilities for patients with bleeding disorders. Marla, go ahead. Okay, and welcome. I'm just going to set my timer so I don't go over. So, um, so what we're what we're going to do here is a little. How did we get here, right? What are skilled nursing facilities? You heard Miriam briefly address this, but we're going to talk a little bit more about it because that's where our patients best fit. When do people need them? How how the SNFs are reimbursed? Why have there been access issues, and what are those access issues? And what the Hemophilia SNF Access Act does, and how does it help our community? And how, and I think most importantly, when will be the law be implemented? And you know, what are some of the other considerations? So first off, what are skilled nursing facilities, right? Everyone seems to think that they're one thing, but Medicare has a very, very, very specific definition about what a SNF is. SNFs are, they provide intensive inpatient rehab services, right? They're nursing and rehab. They can, they're giving medication, they give occupational therapies, physical therapy, speech, dressing changes, all of it. The goal is to include activities of daily living. So getting dressed, driving, brushing teeth, all these things, because they want to be able to return you to your normal activities of daily living. And they, they are facilities that have this level of expertise beyond you know, going home, and we'll get into that in a moment. And <laughs> they can sort of help and teach you because they are trained to do so on how to adjust to independent living and get you back to where you were prior to what caused this, uh, the SNF stay. So they're able to help you facilitate recovery. So, but Medicare also has a number of other long-term care settings. And Medicare's definition of long-term care settings may not be what one considers a long-term care setting. And we, um, we can get to that. So you can't live there indefinitely is basically the upshot. So what are some of these other long-term care settings? You have something called an LTAC. And I recently paced a patient in an LTAC and I was super um, happy about it. And um, and I was, you know, and that just happened. So I'm really kind of proud of that. So LTACs are a little bit different. LTACs provide this long-term care hospitals. They're, they're specialized in treating patients who they know are gonna be admitted for greater than 25 days, right? Not their lifetime, but greater than 25 days. So the, then you have something called an ERF, which is an inpatient rehab facility. These are these intensive inpatient rehab facilities. And when I say intensive, the patients must be able to commit and be physically able to sustain three hours of therapy a day, or at least, at, at least five days a week, or have at least 15 hours of intensive therapy per day, right? These are sort of your like if you're in Boston, you know the Spalding Rehab Hospital. These are for you know people that are having more, that are younger and and able to get out, but they need to show a marked improvement. Whereas the long-term care purpose for um, the LTAC, you know, they're just looking at something much less, right? So you have the the Earth, which is a lot. The LTAC, which is something that they know they're going to pay, um, that you're going to be there for more than 25 days. Then you have an inpatient 
psychiatric facility, right? Medicare has very specific re regulations about um, how each of these entities sort of operate, right? And that, and an, earth, uh, an, an inpatient psychiatric facility can be within a hospital or a standalone facility. So you're wondering why would someone with a bleeding disorder need access to a skilled nursing facility? Because what I just said was that you have the earth, which means a whole lot of physical and occupational therapy daily and hourly, right? And you need to be able to show a marked improvement. So you may not be able to re uh, return home immediately following a hospitalization because you know you need more care, right? So if you have enough surgery related to joint damage or, or have a, a um, something related to a comorbidity like HIV or hepatitis, right? You're going to be more prone to surgery. So the HTC social workers, by and large, um, try to find, I just mean by and large, because they're the ones at the HTC that do the settings, uh, placements. They try to find a setting that meets the medical needs of their patient, right? Which means they need to medically be able to withstand what the facility requires and what the patient needs. So, you, you know, if, 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 you're, if the patient thinks that they can handle an ERF, but everyone else at the HGC is saying, no, they can't, right? They're gonna be, be placed in a skilled nursing facility, or ideally they would be placed in a skilled nursing facility relative to a rehab hospital because they can sustain the level of activity that happens at a skilled nursing facility. But we all know that there've been access issues. Why have there been access issues? Because SNFs get paid a capitated rate or what's called a per diem, a per diem, which means that the SNF bundles all these services. You think about the medical care, the prescription drugs, the IV, the nursing, and the, they make this one giant bundled payment. In that payment is nursing, therapy, and it's all sort of adjusted by this very um, complex algorithm, which you know weights things differently. And it includes room and board, right? If you think about a college student, my son's in college, so I, that's what I think about, room and board. So it includes all of this within that, um, within that one lump sum, okay? And it's adjusted for geographic variability. So if you're in Shreyam, Wyoming, you're not getting paid the same as you're getting um, in New York City, but it's also based on the labor intensive, the amount of labor that's required for the um, type of patient being placed. And why have there been access issues? Is because this one lump sum is expected to cover all the costs, both the operating and capital costs of these facilities. And even if you adjust based on the algorithm, the SNF payment rate, it's still too low to cover the cost of bleeding disorders treatments because even when you adjust all these things, the maximum amount they would get is like 10, you know, estimates can be $10,000 a day. That's not enough. Therefore, most SNFs will not accept a bleeding disorder patient on Medicare. And how did we know that? Well, we know that because we did a survey and um, this problem was largely blocked to us by our social workers, okay? So we asked them, like, how many people are affected, right? So we did a survey of HCC social workers, and if you look at the AFN data set, it estimates there's around 1,000 Medicare beneficiaries with bleeding disorders. So we did a survey of the social workers on, um, in 2019. We did a survey because all um, CMS really wanted to know was how many people are we talking? Are we talking 1,000 people? Are we talking 100,000 people, right? Are we talking 10 people? So what we found is that everyone, 92% of patients were having difficulty accessing skilled nursing facilities, right? Like no matter who you talk to, right? Everyone had an access issue with regard to skilled nursing facilities. And, you know, what was what was the reason we were getting for the reason that the patient was not accepting the patient? And if you look and you're like, okay, so there's a lot of the facilities were claiming that they're unable to infuse clotting factor, which is fascinating because they're able to infuse other things. But mostly they were concerned about the cost of clotting factor, right? You see that 58% were reporting that they were more so concerned about the cost. And then if you ask them, how the what happens to the patients then? If you can't pay them in a skilled nursing facility, which mind you is the medically appropriate setting for the patient to um, return to their activities of normal 
daily living, what happens? Well, it turns out 71% of the patients are being kept longer in the acute care hospital setting. This is bad for several reasons. A, it costs Medicare more to keep them as an acute inpatient setting. B, an acute hospital in inpatient setting, they don't have that level of skilled care that would return the patient to the um, activities of daily living that they had before. Or another thing is that um, the patient went home and the family had challenges caring for the patient. What's wrong with that is that um, as um, Kathleen was discussing, I believe, or, um, was that family and caregivers are not, you know, they know how to help the patient, right? They know how to help the, pa uh, the uh, patient, but they may not be skilled enough, right? They may have jobs. They may have other members of the family to, um, to take care of. So that's a suboptimal setting as well. Or the patient went home with um, home nursing and therapy services. These services are not the same because they don't have that 24 hour level of care. So this became you know, a known issue, right? And so the policy in order to reform this issue was, hey, let's allow the SNFs to bill separately for bleeding disorder treatments and their administration, which we know happens, right? Because when the hospitals, when the patient's an inpatient, when they're an outpatient, we know that they can bill separately for bleeding disorder treatments, specifically um, clotting factor therapies or non-clotting factor therapies. How do we know that? Because other hospitals do it, right? The acute hospital does it. The long-term care hospital does it. The earth does it. The inpatient psych facility does it. These are all different types of facilities that under Medicare, bill separately for factor. They can bill, um, they can provide factor themselves or they can contract with a, a, a third party to provide the factor, right? So this way you have the bundle payment and the clotting factor separate. And now in theory, they can, um, a SNF can bill separately for these clotting factor treatments. Um, we know that some SNFs can bill separately, right? because SNFs have a way to bill other high cost, low incidence services separately. Chemotherapy, chemotherapy administration, radioisotopes and certain prosthetics, okay? These services are also very costly, specialized and beyond you know, what the SNF is typically providing to the average patient. And as I said before, right? So they sort of unbundle these, these specific services and the SNFs can provide them directly or under an arrangement with another part, um, type of provider. We have done, um, this was one of the first things I worked on at NHF and I believe one of my um, um, uh, esteemed colleagues that uh, ran, uh, is on this session as well. Um, we wrote to them in both before my time in 2005 uh, and in 2011, seeking an administrative fix, right? Because CMS knows that these sort of things happen, right? So maybe you can fix this administratively. And then in 2019, NHF and the Alliance met with CMS and submitted comments to every year the SNF regs get sent out. We comment, we ask for an exception because you exclude these things. They say, no, no, this is not an administrative fix. This needs to be a legislative fix. And um, as we were talking about earlier, right? Legislation right now is not really a cool thing. Um, so we, but we did need legislation and it was almost so very close um, introduced in 2014, but let's just say the lead sponsor left. And in 2020, we were able to finally introduce the Hemophilia SNF Access Act. It was a bipartisan bill introduced um, in the House and the Senate and it was companion legislation. So it was exactly the same bill introduced in the House and Senate. And what it did was it unbundled these services and it allowed SNFs to be treated like everywhere else in Medicare for clotting factor, right? It unbundled these services and allowed the SNF to um, either provide for it for themselves and bill separately or contract with a third party. <laughs> Excuse me, okay. We did a ton of leading disorder advocacy on this issue, right? Um, 
we had joint pleading disorder national organizations. You can see on the right, we had the Alliance, HFA, Coalition for Human Failure B, introduced um, all supporting this registration, uh, registration legislation. We included uh, a lot of grassroots advocacy events about it. We did it in our Washington days in February of 2020. We did it on the Alliance Hill Day. And we had a million grassroots contacts, phone calls, and, and, and many, many emails and meetings with bill sponsors. And none of this would have been possible without our community advocates. Everyone really, really pulled together and understood the importance of this issue and understood um, sort of resolving this issue as our patients naturally age into Medicare. And without them, none of this would have been possible. And we finally had success. We had success in a bit of a serendipitous sort of way. Um, it was included, a single bill was included in the Consolidation Appropriations Act in 2020. This was the big year on funding COVID relief package that was passed by Congress on December 21st. The caveat is, and you can see on the right-hand side that it was included. It says blood clotting factors indicated for the treatments of hemophilia and other bleeding disorders all bleeding disorders, it's not just hemophilia, it's not just clotting factor, it's all treatment modalities. And, but it would take effect October 1st. So in like a month and a half, we will have uh, successfully solved this problem and it shouldn't be an issue and SNP can now bill separately for this treatment. Again, October 1st, October 1st, October 1st. Let me say this again, because it's super important, is that like, we, we just wanna be clear, it's not in effect today. It, it takes effect in October, October 1st specifically. There's a lot of things that work um, very well in our favor. We had, um, it was a small policy change. It was small for us, but it would, um, and as far as Medicare was concerned, it was a small, change for them, but it would have a huge impact on our community, right? A lot of the congressional champions, and I could tell um, some really great stories, had very close personal relationships with our community members, like relationships I've never sort of personally experienced and or seen before. And we had, you know, a moving vehicle at the end of 2020, which was a giant 2000 page bill to provide COVID relief. So this was kind of like the lower, sorry, um, the lower end of the total poll, and this policy change was not going to be um, a huge issue. So what will we do next? We, um, we also submitted comments each year, as I mentioned earlier, that the annual SNF rule is updated, right? What, what includes, what's included in that update is you submit comments and every year we have, and we did submit comments so that two new J codes here are will be added um, starting in um, starting in October. Okay, that these J codes, while they may um, while it doesn't take effect until October, and the language they are included, right? They did respond to our comments, and they said that they would absolutely include them. Um, CMS will be issuing some new broader program guidance because we have to educate everybody, right? Because that was in part the problem with the patient at the LTAC is that the LTAC didn't know that they couldn't, that they could bill separately, right? But once we told them, they were like, oh, cool. Yeah, we'll take the patient, right? Because it's a medically appropriate setting. So there's a lot of education. We're going to do that. We're going to, um, develop some fact sheets and, and, um, it will be available to everybody because as Miriam mentioned, is that like, you know, the um, centers won't necessarily know, um, the um, SNFs won't necessarily know that they can do it, right? And that, you know, if the if either the, cent, the HGC or the patient says, here, look, I have a very clear guidance, right? Like it says to do this and bill separately, we can do it. Every year, we, we know that the initial treatments are covered in, the, in this current rule, but every year the rules release and updates are made. So if a new prosthetic comes to market, they update it and it's included. There, you know, similarly, if a new treatment is, comes up and released, the products are going to be added during that comment period. So if it comes out mid-year, okay, right. Like that may be a little bit different, but you know, we know that when the new 
uh, um, updates are included, they will include the newer treatment modality. And that is me, that is my name. And now I can take questions. Thank you so much, Marla. That was just a huge amount of information to absorb quickly. So thank you for- Sorry, I talk really fast. No, you did an excellent job. It's just, it's all the, all of this information with paying and things can be, you know, a complex shift to really think about it. So um, we have a question for you. So how can people get involved and lend their voice and advocate for better coverage and better support for individuals living with beating disorders who are accessing SNFs? Uh, that is an excellent question. Um, I think, right, participate in your local community events, right? Anytime that your local chapter or the, or the national chapters call out, uh, the national organizations call out for support, a lot of times, we will be educating people. Every year we go to Capitol Hill and educate people about the importance of the federal programs that support the community. And though we need your voice. None of this would have happened without patient stories. Patient stories are everything, right? Patient stories are the difference between something succeeding or something failing, right? If you could clearly say to somebody that this happened to me, this happened to my mom, this is how it happened, then that's meaningful, right? And you could always, you could send your story to me. You can send your story to your local chapter. You can send it to Miriam. You could, but it's important to reach out to somebody because without hearing from either HTCs or patients themselves, we didn't know it was a problem, right? Like, you know, how are we supposed to know if it's a problem if no one's reporting it, right? And I think it's important, no matter who you talk to, to, to sort of work within, you know, the system and understand that we're, we're, you know, this is, it's important to get the story to get the problem noticed. And it's also important to understand the story in order to get the problem resolved, right? Right, it's, it's a lot of work um, and it took a lot of work to get here and none of that would have been possible without input from the community from both the providers um, and the patient. And to piggyback on that, so if you are a family member who has a person in your life living with a bleeding disorder who is aging and um, how do you help advocate for them to get sent to a SNF instead of being sent home where they may not be able to readily manage those activities of daily living because of the additional you know, special provisions and care needed to also manage that bleeding disorder. So how do you help really lend that voice to the provider who's making that referral? Well, see, a lot of times it doesn't come down to, right? It, um, they have to be medically appropriate, right? So the physician needs to discharge the patient to a facility which is medically, and there's a long list, Medicare has a ridiculous number of protocols with respect to who can be placed where, right? Um, that, that these patients, you know, must be placed in, and Medicare also has something called a qualifying stay. So you have to be paced directly as an inpatient to a skilled nursing facility. So they like, you can't just go, ah, they're home. They're not doing so like there has to be, there are a number of different qualifying events. So I think you can advocate for your family member by saying, well, maybe maybe a step down facility, a facility which is more capable of handling their needs, right? But it's important to um, understand that they may not clinically meet the criteria in order to be discharged to a staff, right? We, um, they may be more appropriate if, if they're younger and healthier and to go to a inpatient rehab facility or, you know, it's a very important conversation to have with all of your providers with, um, on that, you know? Um, uh, I was just looking at the time we were getting a pop-up, yeah. sorry. Um, uh, it, it's really, it, it's just very critical to understand, you know, what clinically is appropriate and what is, you know, what you may want as a family or, you know, um, as a caregiver. 
may not be what is clinically appropriate because you have to remember the criteria for discharging and placement is based on your need, your ability to improve. Outstanding. Well, thank you so, so much for this information. And, um, you know, this is very, very helpful to be able to have this. So thank you to each of our presenters today so very much for your, your kind words and your great information. Also, thank you again to Cure HHT, Cooley's Anemia Foundation, Hemophilia Federation of America, and the National Hemophilia Foundation for putting together these presentations. And again, generous thanks to Takeda for their sponsorship. Your feedback is very helpful to NHF so that we can do an even better job in 2022 with BDC. So please complete an evaluation form that will be entered into a raffle for $75. And those raffle winners are selected each of the days during the BDC conference and we'll email the winners. So thank you again to our panelists and for everybody who attended today and have a great evening. <laughs>